I'm Martin Reeves, Chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Norina Hertz, who's an English academic, economist, and a writer of several books, but she's just published a new book called The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World that's Been Pulled Apart. Just published in the US late last year in the UK and already winning plaudits. The best, one of the best reads in the Financial Times, top five books from the Daily Telegraph. So Norina, thanks for joining us today to discuss your new book. I'm delighted to be on. So let me kick off by asking you what made an economist write a book about loneliness? What was the motivation? It was three things, three very distinct things. First, I was teaching at university and I was observing that more and more of my students were coming into my office in office hours and confiding in me how lonely and isolated they felt. And this was a new phenomenon. I'd been teaching at university on and off for 20 years and I hadn't seen this before. The second thing was I was researching in my academic research the rise of right-wing populism across the globe, in France, in Germany, in Italy, in the United States as well. And one thing that was coming across time and time again from the testimonies of the right-wing populist voters I was interviewing was how lonely they felt. And the third reason was I had bought an Alexa. And I'm sorry if your device is now going off. Um, and had observed my own interaction with my virtual assistant and how increasingly affectionate I found myself feeling towards her, which got me researching what I call the loneliness economy, an entire economy of goods and services designed essentially to help us feel less on our own, more connected. So it was those three very distinct things young people, my students being increasingly lonely, lonelier than I'd ever seen, loneliness having a political impact linked to the rise of right-wing populism, something I then researched much more in depth, and this new phenomenon, the loneliness economy, a market for goods and services to alleviate loneliness. So I think loneliness is something we all understand intuitively, but We could define it in different ways. How do you usefully define loneliness? So I define loneliness as not only feeling you're craving intimacy and connection with friends and family, although it is that too. It's also a feeling of being disconnected, of feeling disconnected from those you're meant to be close to, but also more broadly feeling disconnected from your government, from politicians, from your fellow citizens, from your employer as well. A feeling of being invisible, unheard, unseen, whether by those around you or by these bigger institutions. It seems plausible that loneliness is increasing. I can identify with that in your story about Alexa. But I'm wondering, how would you prove that we're actually objectively getting more more lonely? Because I imagine it's possible to feel more lonely, even though, according to some objective measure, we're not actually getting more lonely. How do you actually measure that we are getting more lonely? So there is a body of empirical data, so survey data, which has been tracking loneliness now for a considerable period of time. And we can really see quite clearly that over the past 20 years, we've seen a steady increase in loneliness. We see it in surveys of young children, we see it in surveys of teenagers, and we see it in surveys of adults as well. I think it's important to set the stage and make clear just how pervasive loneliness is. One in five American adults feel lonely often or always. This was before the pandemic. One in five millennials said that they didn't have a single friend. Single friend. 40% of office workers said that they felt lonely at work. One in five employees said that they didn't have a single friend at work. So even before the pandemic, loneliness was a very, very significant issue. And the pandemic, of course, has made it significantly worse it's estimated that around 50% of Americans are currently feeling lonely. I noticed that you said that we feel lonely. Is it just the sentiment that we feel lonely or objectively do we have less connection with each other? So loneliness is defined as a feeling. There are objective measures like social isolation, how big your social network is, but those are not necessarily always perfectly correlated with how lonely you are. I mean, you can be lonely in a crowd of people and you can be on your own and not feel lonely. So lonely is an expression of a lack of something, of being seen, 
worth having intimacy, so a feeling of lack. Your book seems to be some sort of call to attention or call to action. And I'm wondering, in the loneliness phenomenon, what are we missing, what are we underestimating that requires you to write this book? So I think what we're underestimating is the extent to which it matters. Loneliness is bad for our health, not only for our mental health, for our physical health as well. Loneliness is as bad for us as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness is bad for our wealth, not only in terms of the increased healthcare costs that governments have to pay out to deal with the public health problem that is loneliness, but also because loneliness is bad for business. Lonely workers are less productive, less motivated, less efficient, more likely to leave a company and less engaged than workers who aren't. And loneliness also is significantly affecting who people vote for. So I think it hasn't been getting the attention it needs to have because people perhaps haven't realized how profound an effect it's having on our health, on our wealth, and even on the state of our democracy. You mentioned the impact of loneliness on business. I'm wondering, do you see businesses also as a a partial cause of the loneliness phenomenon you describe? Business can be a cause and it can also be a solution. Um, It plays both roles. It has a dual role in the loneliness crisis. Some businesses and some types of businesses clearly are playing a detrimental role in promulgating and exacerbating loneliness, notably social media companies. I began my research very agnostic as to the role that social media is playing in today's loneliness crisis. But my research, having studied paper after paper after paper and interviewed many young people especially, I've come away pretty sure that social media is playing a significant role in how lonely we feel. Lonely because it's disconnecting us from each other, where our heads are in our phones and so we're not present with those around us, making us lonelier because social media is so addictive that it's keeping us away from people around us, making us lonelier, making young people lonely because it's such an excluding medium, something parents may not be aware of, but because so much of young people's social lives has migrated to their phones, often they're being excluded and the adults in their lives are just not even aware of it. Um, Not aware that their child's not being invited to something on a WhatsApp group, not aware that they're scrolling on their feeds, seeing their other friends hanging out without them. And also, of course, making us lonelier because the environment is such a toxic one. 65% of British students have directly experienced cyberbullying, for example. So some businesses exacerbating the problem for sure. The workplace playing a clear role in making employees feel lonelier. Some of the reasons for this are unexpected. One of the things that I didn't expect when I started looking at open plan offices, for example, was that they would have a negative role when it came to how lonely or not employees felt. Yet it turns out that open plan offices, which you might think were designed to make people collaborate more and communicate more, actually, it turns out, can have the absolute opposite effect. There was research done by Harvard University where they tracked people who worked in a company who moved from cubicles to open plan offices. And what they found was that when people moved to the open plan office, they didn't speak more to their colleagues face to face. They actually spoke less to them and instead chose to communicate by some sort of messaging app or by email, the Panopticon office where everyone's looking at you, where you have to put your noise cancelling headphones on to get any work done, it turns out is not conducive to a connected workforce. There are other practices in the workplace which my research has kind of highlighted that also can be playing a negative role when it comes to how connected or otherwise your employees feel. Something as simple as eating together. When we were back in the office, if we can still remember those moments, 60% of professionals ate their lunch on their own in front of their screen, Aldesco. And yet, researchers have found that employees who eat together perform better than employees 
who don't, there were researchers who looked at companies of firefighters in Chicago. They wanted to understand why particular companies outperformed others. What they found was that companies of firefighters who ate together performed twice as well as companies who didn't. And there was research done at an American bank, not this time with eating together, but employees taking breaks together. And what they found was when they piloted everyone taking breaks at the same time, what they found was that employees felt more connected to each other and again were significantly more productive. So sometimes it's these small things that you don't even think about that can make a real difference as to how connected, how lonely your employees feel, and therefore how productive and efficient and engaged they are. Let me um, double click on technology there, because you started off uh, today by talking about the market for loneliness, for products which deal with loneliness. You seem to be implying that these products cannot be entirely effective, that there's something irreducible about human contact that cannot be technologically substituted. Um, So I'm wondering how you're seeing the role of working from home, distant working, for example, how do we deal with loneliness in the context where that is, at least for the time being, a given? I'm actually quite excited about the prospects of technology being a solution or a partial solution to today's loneliness crisis. And I've been looking a lot at social robots and emotional AI, and I think it will play an increasingly important role in alleviating individual loneliness, especially amongst the elderly, for example, where already in Japan, for example, where the take-up of social robots as carers is high, you have situations of elderly women knitting bonnets for their robot carers. So I actually think technology has got a role to play in terms of solutions and also platforms that bring different types of people together. I think there's a real opportunity there as well. But when it comes to remote work, I think Many companies and many CEOs I've been speaking to in recent months are reporting that the initial euphoria that many felt in the workplace when working from home was first introduced now a year ago has by now worn off by and large. And many employees are now feeling lonely and isolated. You know, this can depend on your own personal circumstances, of course. There are some differences. There seem to be on age. Younger employees seem to be, on the whole, missing the office more. Although I have spoken to quite a few C-suite executives who've confided in me that they said to me, one of them, um, a senior partner at a major law firm said to me the other day, I never used to consider my work colleagues to be my friends, but now I realize that they actually are and I'm missing them. And I think a lot of people are missing the office. So I think navigating this moment of remote work is a significant challenge. And I would be cautious when thinking about how your company should proceed post-pandemic, because I know that there is a temptation to Think about the cost savings of slashing your physical footprint moving forward and implementing a new policy whereby everyone now works remotely without recognizing the downside risk, without recognizing that there is a significant cost associated to that as well, a cost in terms of how your employees feel and therefore how effective productive, engaged, committed they are. And I think some employers are are not recognizing that at the moment. So let's move on to solutions. The complexity, it seems to me here, is that when you're talking about causes in your book, you almost seem to be describing modern life, urbanization, technology, and so on. And perhaps one might consider that it's unrealistic to roll all of that back. So perhaps the solution is not the inverse of the problem, in the inverse of the causes. So you know, accepting that much of what we have now in terms of technology and remote working is at least to some degree inevitable. What can we do within this new context to deal with loneliness, do you think? So I think, well, firstly, it's about recognizing what is impossible to change and what can change. And there are things for sure that can change. So yes, I'm not a Luddite by any means, but I do believe that social media can be regulated much more strongly and should be, for example. In the workplace, I think there's some really tangible things that business leaders can do. First of all, have 
an open and frank discussion around loneliness in your workplace. If 50% of Americans are currently lonely, this is a conversation that needs to be happening. So when you're doing your employee pulse surveys or whatever you're doing in order to ascertain how your employees are feeling, and I know many companies are doing these very regularly at the moment, make sure that there are some questions in that around loneliness specifically so that you can see your baseline and work out how to improve. I think the second thing you can do is think about how do you help people connect better to each other and feel more connected to each other in this period of remote working. There are no silver bullets here. People are experimenting with different things. I can share with you a couple of things that that companies have shared with me that I think are interesting. One company, they have implemented a scheme whereby everyone in the company at whatever level they're at has contributed a photograph representing something that they're passionate about. So it might be a photo of your football hero, or it might be a photo of a cake if you're into baking. And then people have matched up and congregated around interests. And what's actually been fascinating is that in this company, what's happened is that people have actually come together um, virtually who would have never actually met and ordinarily interacted because they would have been so stratified within the organization. So I think that's a great idea. Um, I think as managers, it's about regularly checking in with your remote staff. It's in meetings, recognizing that the world of Zoom really plays to some people well, but to others is really quite onerous and really consciously drawing out the more introverted member of the team who you know might be finding it challenging to put that get their voices across on zoom get their voice across on zoom so really helping facilitate better but checking in with your staff um, not only about how their work's going but also how they are doing themselves but loneliness is also about a sense of feeling invisible and not having voice and companies can do better on that front as well today you know whether it's virtual town halls whether it's opportunities to co-create policies for the for how you as a company will work moving forward I think looking for opportunities for employees to provide voice I think when we go back into the office it is thinking about the fact that office design does have an impact on how people feel and how people interact and If you are a fully open plan space, thinking about how you might want to create more private spaces for people. Um, It's about putting into your office, if you don't have one already, a place where people can eat together. This doesn't, I'm not talking about a fancy cafeteria. You don't need to do that. But even just having tables where people can bring their food and eat family style and actively encouraging it can make a real difference. It's also about people not feeling cared for and thinking about your employees in a more 360 sense, by which I mean thinking about how you can help your employees care for others themselves. Some companies have been making inroads here. Salesforce, for example, gives nine paid days a year to its employees to do voluntary work within their communities. Centrica, a UK energy company, implemented paid leave for people to be able to take off to care for elderly parents, for example. So I think it's about recognizing that if you want to have caring staff who care for each other, um, helping them to care for those in their wider networks is the right thing to do. And there's one other thing that a company is doing that I think speaks well to helping your staff feel more connected, more engaged and more cared for. And it's Cisco. They have a scheme called Tokens of Appreciation, whereby anyone up and down the company can nominate anyone else in the company for a cash reward, anywhere between $100 and $10,000 for being particularly nice, kind, helpful collaborative. It's a scheme that the employees there really love. And I think it you know, is undoubtedly part of the reason that Cisco was voted last year the best company in the world to work for. So you mentioned a number of companies that, that were getting it right. I know you've done some international comparisons in your book and you looked at the international uh, research. 
are there countries which are getting it more right than others? And if so, what can we learn from them? There are some countries that have acknowledged and explicitly singled out loneliness as a problem. In the UK, for example, we have a minister for loneliness. This is a government minister charged with addressing loneliness. I don't actually think that's the right strategy for a government because it means that loneliness then gets put into a very siloed bucket and actually so many of its drivers are structural and need to be addressed. And also, you know, in the UK's case, because it's quite a junior ministerial position, the budget is pretty low. And so there is a danger that such a ministry can become relatively tokenistic. I think more interesting and um, bluer sky thinking is what Jacinda Ardem, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, is doing, where she is now committed to a well-being budget, which doesn't only focus on traditional economic metrics like GDP when determining which policies to implement, but also looks at broader metrics, including loneliness and how trusting citizens are and how much trust citizens have in each other and in the government. And I think having some of these newer metrics as lodestars for governments could go a long way here. So last question, if I may, Narina, if I'm a CEO listening to this and I wanted to embark upon this agenda to do something, where would I start? What are the high leverage moves that a leader could use to kickstart the agenda to address loneliness issues? Well, first of all, if you can be vulnerable yourself, if there's ever a moment to say to your staff, these are challenging times, times that are testing us like never before, challenging me as well, personally, of course. I mean, this is the time to say it, to express your own vulnerability, because by doing that, you're opening the door to people up and down the organization feeling that they can first of all start talking about how they're feeling, about whether they're feeling isolated or lonely. But it's not enough to start the conversation. It's also as a leader, as a CEO, showing that you're committed to doing something about this. So whether it's very generally having a greater commitment to protecting and and, um, safeguarding the mental and physical health of your employees, or more specifically, looking at ways to ensure that your staff aren't as lonely moving forward. You know, if 40% of office workers globally felt lonely, odds are a significant number of your employees were feeling lonely even before the pandemic and are likely to be feeling lonelier now. So start measuring it and start doing something about it. And my book's full of ideas of what you can do. We've talked about some of them today. So I think we have to leave it there, Narina. Uh, it's been fascinating. Thanks for sharing insights from your new book, The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World That's Pulling Apart, which was published by Crown in the US in February. And I'd recommend it as a read on an important new subject for business, which may have been exacerbated by COVID and a good read to sensitize us to this new issue. So thank you again, Narina. Thank you.